I know that I am way off in choosing this for late April, but I thought I would share with you today the story of the Magi. Maybe it's just because after weeks of living with the stay-at-home order that I want to hear a story about travelers. Uh, I thought maybe that's what we needed. I don't know. Uh, I thought I'd also have a little fun starting off with this tonight by asking you some questions because I really love trivia. So the first question I have for you about the Magi is how many of these individuals were there? Two, three, four, five, more than five? What's your answer to that? Next question, what were their names? I know that one gets a little bit harder, but some of you are nerdy out there enough to perhaps know the answer to that one. So what were their names? And the last question, what was their vocation? What did they do? What was their occupation? Okay, hopefully you're keeping those answers in your head and let's find out how, how you all did uh, as we read the gospel according to Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, and for you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Today's reading has captured the imaginations of Christians for years. Even in the early church, there was interest in these mysterious visitors that came to gift baby Jesus with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But... We know so little about them from Scripture. Did you notice that it didn't say how many there were? Despite the We Three Kings song, there is certainly a popular answer, uh, and that would be three. Uh, but it's likely that that probably just comes because there were three gifts that were given in the Scripture. Of course, this assumes that none of the visitors were cheap and needing to share a gift to Jesus. Personally, with gifts as costly as pure gold, I would likely need to, you know, go in on a gift with a group of people. Early Christian artwork found in tombs depicts the Magi as a group of two or four. The Eastern Church recognizes 12 Magi, and other early artwork shows hundreds of Magi visiting baby Jesus. Clearly, there were some cheap pastors in that group. The Magi are also never given names in Scripture. Sorry, Balthazar, Melchior, and Casper. And they're certainly not kings, or even wise men. Matthew originally terms these visitors magi, but our English translation is more comfortable calling them wise men. In Greek, magos, or magi, means a wizard, a sorcerer, a professor of the arts of witchcraft, which sounds like Harry Potter to me. According to scripture, it was wizards that came to visit the baby Jesus and bring him gifts. But over the years, that seemed a little too strange and scandalous, so we started calling them wise men. Scholars probably of some type, knowledgeable in scripture and really important things that we should all be impressed with. So we know very little about these visitors, but we know more about Jesus. And clearly that's by design, since Jesus is always the main character in the gospel stories. He is presented in this story in contrast to Herod. And readers have a choice, King Herod or King Jesus. 
One is a powerful tyrant who rules over his people with violence, and the other a defenseless baby whose power is hidden in mercy and humility. There is a contrast also between Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Bethlehem. One is a large city that is home to powers of all sorts. It's the heart of religion and culture and economy for the region. Jerusalem is home to the king and to the great temple. Bethlehem is a dusty rural outpost with shepherds, farmers, and other unnoticeables. Matthew's point in all of this is that Jesus is not about security, power, riches, or dominance, but vulnerability, modesty, humility, and generosity. In our lives, vulnerability is not all that desirable, right? I mean, we say that modesty, humility, and generosity are virtues, but we don't always live that way. We've learned in the real world those who you know, those things don't get us very far. But more often the goals of our world are achieved by the aggressive, self-focused, and ruthless types. For Herod is far more successful in our world than Jesus, at least by the standards that we normally judge success. And that's why Herod becomes king and Jesus ends up being nailed to a cross. And so all of those comparisons and contrasts, they leave the Magi and with all of us with some choices. How will we respond? Some, like Herod, will show hostility towards Jesus, while others, like the Magi, are drawn to worship him. And that's the question that I have pondered about the Magi. I'm not all that interested in their names or how many there, there were, but I want to know why they came there in the first place? What drove them to worship this modest and humble child? What caused them to give up their riches and gifts? And what caused them to risk all of that, to double-cross a powerful and vengeful King Herod? A star? Really? I've never seen a star so beautiful as to risk my life double-crossing a violent king especially for some homeless child who is about to become a refugee in Egypt. So maybe it's something more. Perhaps it was a voice that called to them and said, go. A voice that whispered to them from beyond time and place. Could it be that the Spirit is yet again at work in our world, pointing those with open minds and curious hearts to the unexpected Messiah? These visitors were the first to worship Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, but many others would follow. And perhaps none of them could really answer the question, why? I'm guessing they would say the motivation to do so was unexplainable, but yet more powerful than any army. The calling of the star or the spirit brought a sense of peace that they have never before experienced. And so to worship was the only thing they could do. And in fact, I bet they would all say it never even seemed like a choice. Today, these magi, these mysterious visitors, remind us that worshiping Jesus is not easy. The magi traveled so far and sacrificed so much just to be in the presence of the one who is shepherding all of God's people. In today's world, you aren't asked to even travel at all to worship. In fact, you're asked to stay home. But as we all know, that's not easy either. Yet as faithful worshipers of Jesus, we do so because we are following the shepherd and we are people who know that vulnerability, modesty, humility, and generosity are important. Who knows why the Magi chose worship over hostility? Herod obviously made another choice. Today, you all made a choice to worship the unexpected Messiah. Which leads me to my final question, perhaps one that's best answered after time of deep consideration. Why do you worship Jesus? What drove you to worship this modest and humble child? Perhaps we have more in common with these mysterious visitors than we may think. 
Perhaps that's why Matthew left so many details out about these worshipers, so we could see ourselves in their lives and join them in paying homage. Perhaps with all the decisions that we face in our lives, we aren't really that different from the Magi. Perhaps we will be called by the Holy Spirit to choose worship, vulnerability, modesty, humility, and generosity. Perhaps we already have. Perhaps. Amen.